to jump into the technical for a little bit, mm -hmm. so uh, the magic of post training. Yep. <laughs> Why do you think RLHF works so well to make the model seem smarter, to make it more interesting and useful to talk to, and mm -hmm. so on? I think there's just a huge amount of um, information in the data that humans provide, like when we provide preferences, especially because different people are going to like pick up on really subtle and small things. So I've thought about this before where you probably have some people who just really care about good grammar use from models, like, you know, was a semicolon used correctly or something. And so you probably end up with a bunch of data in there that like, you know, you as a human, if you're looking at that data, you wouldn't even see that. Like, you'd be like, why did they prefer this response to that one? I don't get it. And then the reason is you don't care about semicolon usage, mm -hmm. but that person does. Um, and so each of these like single data points has, you know, like, and this model just ha like has so many of those and has to try and figure out like, what is it that humans want in this like really kind of complex, you know, like across all domains, um, they're going to be seeing this in a, across like many contexts. It feels like kind of like the classic issue of like deep learning where, you know, historically we've tried to like, you know, do edge detection by like mapping things out. And it turns out that actually, if you just have a huge amount of data that like, actually accurately represents the picture of the thing that you're trying to train the model to to learn that's like more powerful than anything else and so i think one reason is just that you are training the model on exactly the task and with like a lot of data um that represents kind of many different angles on which people prefer and disprefer responses um i think there is a question of like are you eliciting things from pre-trained models or are you like kind of teaching new things to models and like in principle you can teach new things to models in post-training i do think a lot of it is eliciting powerful pre-trained models so people are probably divided on this because obviously in principle you can you can definitely like teach new things um but i think for the most part for a lot of the capabilities that we um most use and care about uh a lot of that feels like it's like there in the pre-trained models and uh, reinforcement learning is kind of eliciting it and getting the models to like bring it out. So the other side of uh, post training, this really cool idea of constitutional AI, mm -hmm. you're one of the people that are critical to creating that idea. Yeah, I worked on it. Can you explain this idea from your perspective? Like how does it integrate into making Claude what it is? Yeah. By the way, do you gender Claude or no? It's weird because I think that a lot of people prefer he for Claude. I actually kind of like that. I think Claude is usually it's slightly male leaning, but it's like a you can it can be male or female, which is quite nice. Um, I still use it, and I've I'm I have mixed feelings about this because I'm like maybe like I now just think of it as like uh, or I think of like the the it pronoun for Claude as I don't know. It's just like the one I associate with Claude. Um, I can imagine people moving to like he or she. It feels somehow disrespectful. Like I'm, I'm denying the intelligence of this entity by calling it it. Yeah. I remember always don't gender the robots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. I anthropomorphize pretty quickly and construct it like a backstory in yeah. my head. So I've wondered if I anthropomorphize things too much. Um, because, you know, I have this, like, with my car, especially, like, my car, like, my car and, and bikes, you know, like, I don't give them names because then I once had, I used to name my bikes and then I had a bike that got stolen and I cried for, like, a week. And I was like, if I'd not, never given it a name, I wouldn't have been so upset. I felt like I'd let it down. Um, maybe it's that, I've wondered as well, like, it might depend on how much it feels like a kind of, like, objectifying pronoun. Like, if you just think of it as, like, a, um, this is a pronoun that, like, objects often have and maybe AIs can have that pronoun and that doesn't mean that I think of uh, if I call Claude it that I think of it as less um, intelligent or like I'm being disrespectful I'm just like you are a different kind of entity and so that's I'm going to give you the kind of uh, the respectful it yeah anyway <laughs> <laughs> the divergence was beautiful the constitutional AI right. idea how does it work so there's like a couple of components of it the main component that I think people find interesting is the kind of reinforcement learning from AI feedback. So you take a model that's already trained and you show it 
two responses to a query and you have like a principle. So suppose the principle, like we've tried this with harmlessness a lot. So suppose that the query is about um, weapons and your principle is like select the response that like is less likely to uh, like encourage people to purchase illegal weapons. Like that's probably a fairly specific principle, but you can give any number. Um, and the model will give you a kind of ranking and you can use this as preference data in the same way that you use human preference data um, and train the models to have these relevant traits um, from their feedback alone instead of from human feedback. So if you imagine that, like I said earlier with the human who just prefers the kind of like semicolon usage in this particular case, um, you're kind of taking lots of things that could make a response preferable um, and uh, getting models to do the labeling for you basically. There's a nice like trade-off between helpfulness and harmlessness. And you know, when you integrate something like constitutional and AI, you can make them up without sacrificing much helpfulness, make it more harmless. Yeah. In principle, you could use this for anything. Um, and so harmlessness is a task that it might just be easier to spot. So when models are like less capable, you can use them to uh rank things according to like principles that are fairly simple and they'll probably get it right. So I think one question is just like, is it the case that the data that they're adding is like fairly reliable? Um, but if you had models that were like extremely good at telling whether um, one response was more historically accurate than another, in principle, you could also get AI feedback on that task as well. There's like a kind of nice interpretability component to it because you can see the principles that went into the model when it was like being trained. Um, and also it's like, and, and it gives you like a degree of control. So if you were seeing issues in a model, like it wasn't having enough of a certain trait, um, then like you can add data relatively quickly that should just like train the model to have that trait. So it creates its own data for, for training, which is quite nice. Yeah, it's really nice because it creates this human interpretable document that you can, I can imagine in the future, there's just gigantic fights in politics over the every single principle and so on. Yeah. And at least it's made explicit and you can have a discussion about the phrasing and the, you know. So maybe the actual behavior of the model is not so cleanly mapped to those principles. It's not like adhering strictly to them. It's just a nudge. Yeah, I've actually worried about this because the character training is sort of like a variant of the const constitutional AI approach. Um, I've worried that people think that the constitution is like just, it, it's the whole thing again of, I, I don't know, like it, it, where it would be really nice if what I was just doing was telling the model exactly what to do, and just exactly how to behave. But it's definitely not doing that, especially because it's interacting with human data. So for example, if you see a certain like leaning in the model, like if it comes out with a political leaning from training um, from the human preference data, you can nudge against that. You know, so if you could be like, oh, like consider these values because let's say it's just like never inclined to like, I don't know, maybe it never considers like privacy as like a, I mean, this is implausible, but like um, in anything where it's just kind of like, uh, there's already a pre-existing like bias towards a certain behavior, um, you can like nudge away. This can change both the principles that you put in and the strength of them. So you might have a principle that's like, imagine that the model um, was always like extremely dismissive of, I don't know, like some political or religious view for whatever reason. Like, so you're like, oh no, this is terrible. Um, if that happens, you might put like never, ever, like ever prefer like a criticism of this like religious or political view. And then people would look at that and be like, never, ever. And then you're like, no, if it comes out with a disposition, saying never, ever might just mean like instead of getting like 40%, which is what you would get if you just said, don't do this, you you get like 80%, which is like what you actually like wanted. And so it's that thing of both the nature of the actual principles you add and how you phrase them. I think if people would look, they're like, oh, this is exactly what you want from the model. And I'm like, mm, no, that's like how we... That's how we nudged the model to have a better shape, uh, which doesn't mean that we actually agree with that wording, uh, if that makes sense. 